Hello and Namaste. I am Dr. Asraf Hussain, working as a lecturer in the Department of Internal Medicine at National Medical College and Teaching Hospital, Birganj, Nepal. Today we are going to talk about pulmonary embolism, the great masquerader. Objectives of today's talk will be definition, etiology, pathophysiology, diagnosis and treatment of pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary thromboembolism is a thrombosis originating in the venous system and embolizing to the pulmonary arterial circulation. The virtuous triad for thrombogenesis include stasis, injury to endothelium, and thrombophilia, bed rest, inactivity, congestive heart failure, cerebrovascular accident within 3 months, air travel for more than 6 hours, and e thrombosis contribute to stasis. Trauma surgery, prior DVT, and inflammation contribute to injury to endothelium. Factor V laden gene mutation, prothrombin gene mutation, activated protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, increased factor VIII, hyperhomocysteinemia, heparin induced thrombocytopenia, oral contraceptive pills, hormone replacement therapy, tamoxifen, raloxifen contribute to thrombophilia. Stasis, injury to endothelium, Thrombophilia are virtuous triad that lead to thrombogenesis and causes pulmonary embolism. Malignancy causes 12% of idiopathic deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Pathophysiology of pulmonary embolism The thrombus in the deep veins gets dislodged and embolizes the pulmonary arterial circulation, leading to pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism causes Increased pulmonary arterial vascular resistance leading to increased right ventricular afterload which causes right ventricular dysfunction and increased right ventricular volume. There is leftward septal bowing and which is further contributed by pericardial restriction that leads to decreased left ventricular distentability and decreased left ventricular preload which will cause decreased right ventricular output and also decreased right ventricular coronary perfusion leading to ischemia and overall there is decreased cardiac output. Patient will present with following symptoms. Dyspnea which is sudden onset is most common symptom. Patient can also present with chest pain which can be pleuritic or atypical. Patient presents with anxiety, cough and hemoptysis and dizziness or syncope which is because of right heart failure. Signs of pulmonary embolism are tachypnea and tachycardia, hypoxia, cyanosis, low-grade fever. When we examine cardiac system, we get gallop rhythm, jugular venous distension, loud P2, right ventricular heave, widely split S2 and tricuspid regurgitation. Patient can also present with hemoptysis and signs of DVT like leg edema, erythema and tenderness. Systemic hypotension and cardiogenic shock can be present if the embolus is massive. Wells criteria for assessment of pretest probability. There are various criteria given various points. A score range if it is less than 2 point, interpretation of risk will be low. If the score is between 2 to 6 points, there is moderate risk. And if there is more than 6 points, the chances are high. Criteria are suspected DVT and when an alternative diagnosis is less likely than P, each having 3 points. Tachycardia with heart rate of more than 100 and immobilization or surgery in the previous 4 weeks with previous history of DVT or P carry 1.5 points each. Hemoptysis and malignancy will carry 1 point each. Classification of pulmonary embolism. It can be categorized as massive, submassive, and a small to moderate pulmonary embolism. Massive pulmonary embolism is present in 5 to 10 percent of the cases, and they present with systolic blood pressure of less than 90 mm of mercury or poor tissue perfusion or multi system organ failure plus extensive thrombosis, such as saddle pulmonary embolism or right or left main pulmonary artery thrombosis. Submassive pulmonary embolism, which contributes to 20 to 25% of the pulmonary embolism cases, can present as 
hemodynamically stable but moderate or severe right ventricular dysfunction or enlargement which may be coupled with biomarker elevation which is indicative of right ventricular microinfarction and or right ventricular pressure overload a small to moderate pulmonary embolism are most common forms which are present in 70% of cases they present with normal hemodynamics and normal right ventricular size and function in diagnostic tests and laboratories arterial blood blood gas may reveal hypoxemia hypocapnia and respiratory alkalosis bnp levels are greater in patients with pulmonary embolism compared to other patients elevations of bnp level correlates with risk of subsequent complications and prolonged hospitalization serum troponin i and t are elevated in 30 to 50 percent who have moderate to large pulmonary embolism when we do d-dimer testing it has sensitivity of about 96 percent but specificity is low negative predictive value of d-dimer testing is high and a normal d-dimer level renders acute p or dbt unlikely so if a patient is less than 50 years old the d-dimer cutoff value is 500 nanogram per ml but for patients more than 50 years of age we actually calculate it by multiplying old patient age into 10 for example 78 year old patient cutoff value will be 780 nanogram per ml age adjusted cutoff would increase the diagnostic yield of d-dimer by 10 percent from 25 to 35 percent of all patients tested ECG will show sinus tachycardia which is most common presentation in ECG. It may also show atrial fibrillation, P pulmonary or right ventricular strain patterns which are suggestive of severe pulmonary embolism in form of inverted T waves from V1 to V4, incomplete right bundle branch block or classical S1Q3 T3 pattern. This slide shows the classical S1Q3 T3 pattern along with classical T wave changes in V1, V2, V3 and V4. When we talk about chest X-ray, it can show cardiomegaly, atelectasis, elevated hemidiaphragm, pulmonary artery enlargement, pleural effusion, parenchymal pulmonary infiltrates. But not to forget that a fair bit of patients will present with normal chest X-ray study. There are few eponyms of pulmonary embolism if these eponyms are like Westermark sign which is characterized by focal demarcated oligemia, Hampton's hump which is characterized by a triangular or rounded pleural based infiltrate with the apex towards the hilum usually located adjacent to the hilum or Pallas sign which is characterized by prominent right descending pulmonary artery. Now there are two x-rays shown in this slide first one shows melting sign which means rapid clearing in contrast to pneumonia consolidation and second is Flissner sign which is characterized by prominent central artery secondary to pulmonary arterial hypertension or large pulmonary embolism. Echocardiography may show right ventricular overload and dysfunction. McConnell sign which is characterized by the hypokinetic free valve with normally apex. So McConnell sign is a sign of acute pulmonary embolism which is because of right ventricular strain. In CT angiogram allows us to adequately visualize the pulmonary arteries down to at least the segmental level. Contrast enhanced multi-detector CTPA is currently the preferred method of diagnosis. Pulmonary angiography is a definite diagnostic test or gold standard in diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. A filling defect or abrupt cutoff of a small vessel is indicative of embolus. A negative pulmonary angiogram will exclude clinically relevant pulmonary embolism. Now in this slide, we can see the arrow that indicates abrupt termination of a pulmonary artery. Lower limb ultrasonography is an important diagnostic tool. Proximal DBT in a patient with clinical suspicion of pulmonary embolism will confirm pulmonary embolism. Distal deep vein thrombosis will lead to further testing to consider to confirm pulmonary embolism. Almost 50% patients with symptomatic deep vein thrombosis will have asymptomatic pulmonary embolism. Now talking about the treatment part, thrombolysis will restore pulmonary perfusion more rapidly than anticoagulation 
leading to a prompt reduction in pulmonary artery pressure and resistance with a concomitant improvement in right ventricular function. The greatest benefit is observed when treatment is initiated within 48 hours after the onset of symptoms, but thrombolysis can still be effective in patients who have had symptoms for up to 14 days. Recombinant tissue plasminogen activator is preferred. Indications of thrombolysis Systemic thrombolysis should be considered only after acute pulmonary embolism has been confirmed and the pulmonary embolism has to be massive which will be characterized by persistent hypotension that is systolic blood pressure of less than 90 mm of mercury or decrease in systolic blood pressure by more than 40 mm of mercury from baseline. The patient will present with right ventricular dysfunction. Talking about initiative of initiation of anticoagulation therapy, administration of parenteral anticoagulation on fractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, or fondaparinux over the first 5 to 10 days is mandatory. Parenteral heparin should overlap with the initiation of a vitamin K antagonist. Oral treatment with newer agents in form of rivaroxaban or apixaban can be started directly. Acute phase treatment consists of an increased dose of the oral anticoagulant over the first 3 weeks for rivaroxaban or over the first 7 days for apixaban. Thank you. With the promise to come up with further new slides and further discussion about different medical topics. For now, I want to say you a goodbye. Thank you.